Same here. Nice to be seen. Thank you. <laughs> you feeling like a million dollars? We're on it. There we go. Excellent. Yes, we're back from a little refresh and we're good to go. Wonderful. All right. Well, everybody, I am so stoked for today's webinar. My dear friend, Pat Zabe here is burst in with information and I'm particularly excited about some of the um, dialogues he's already shared with me to work buyers through what's going on with the interest rates. So I don't want to eat up a lot of time. Pat, uh, anything um, that you want to share bio-wise before we get started? Well, not a whole lot. Maybe just, uh, and by the way, thank you very much for inviting me to do this. <clears throat> uh, you know, I know a, there's a lot of experience on the other side of this video, uh, <laughs> on the other side of the screen. And so uh, what's interesting is the, the one topic we're pairing out today, which is the assumptions, is something that unless you've done some in the last year, you probably haven't done them in your career, uh, with the exception of a few people that have been around for a while. Now, uh, without dating myself too much, but I'm, I'm going to anyway, I got my real estate license in 1968. And uh, at that time, interest rates were eight and a half percent. And the very next year, they went to seven percent. Well, you could buy a 25% larger house if you could just get rid of the one that you owned and uh, because you were, had the obligation of the debt, of course. Well, that's what got me started in rental property was that we as investors could assume these FHA and VA loans. And it was a really wonderful thing to be able to do. But that came to a screeching halt. And, and then a couple of other factors that have made assumptions really not a viable uh, practical situation for about 30 years. And so we're going to look at it today. And we're also gonna look at another concept. And this is part of the, I do a course for CRS that is a finance course. Now, when I first got into real estate business and really until probably the early nineties, Everybody, every agent knew something about financing. It was something that you were required to know. Well, then in the 90s, it got so easy. If you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan approved. It was just that easy. And you'd think after all those savings and loans were put out of business in the early 90s, the lending uh, uh, industry would have understood that but they didn't because look what happened again in the mid 2000s. What happened was uh, we had the financial crisis that came because of all those subprime mortgages that were out there. And we learned it that same lesson all over again. Well, brokers used to tell their agents, don't worry about financing because anybody can get a loan. And if you knew need something, go talk to your lender. Well, the problem with that is some of the lenders out there right now have never even heard of an assumption. Uh, they don't even understand some of the other concepts like two one buy downs and things like that. A little bit, but not a whole lot. And, and so I really believe this is a way for agents to distinguish themselves from their competition. Uh, in fact, I've got some stats I'm going to show you here that just came out. Uh, at the end of December, and NAR said that their membership had hit an all-time high at uh, just under 1.6 million realtors. Now, with more realtors out there, becomes more competition, of course, for all of us, but there are less sales going on right now. In fact, the latest number that I just saw, they revised this uh, 2022 to 4.2 million in home sales. Uh, so that's down 35% year over year. And they will go back up. We're not preaching doom and gloom or anything. But the problem with that is, if you look at the average realtor, which I'm convinced 50% of the agents out there, the 50% of the members that are realtors don't sell a single house. But at any rate, that's still five 
transaction sides a year. Well, that's certainly not the target market that, that we want to uh, go after. So, so we want to do something that distinguishes us from our competition, makes us the source of real estate information so that we have a brand that we can count on and uh, top of mind awareness. And, and that's what this does. Now, probably, as I'm looking at different people in the screenshot, I know you've heard this from for decades, maybe. There's five factors in the marketing position of any home. Starts with price, very important. Location, condition. The fourth one is terms. And then the fifth one, of course, is a variable, depending on who you're talking to. Some people say the seller's motivation. If you look at it from a seller standpoint, they would say the agent we select. But it's this fourth one that I want to talk about it when we talk about financing. Terms means making it more affordable for the person, finding the right loan, finding alternative financing, and things like that. Well, if you learn this type of information, you can create not only a point of difference, you'll create a point of difference that has a barrier to entry because the typical agent doesn't want the effort. They don't want to go to the effort to learn about financing. They don't want to have to learn how to use a financial calculator. They don't want to have to stay up to date with all this information. So they depend on their, their mortgage broker, which you need a good mortgage broker. You need two or three because some of them specialize in different types of mortgage, but we build this all into our brand. So with all of that said, let's start talking about assumptions. And the first question that always comes up is, well, what happened to them in the first place? Did they just go away, you know? And uh, here's what happened. In the early 80s, the conventional mortgages, and that would be Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, decided that they were no longer going to allow uh, the interest rate to remain the same on a mortgage. Uh, they said, yes, you can assume it, but we have the right to escalate it to the current rate. When that happened, most people would say, well, why in the world would I do that? Why don't I just get a new mortgage? So for all intents purposes, that ended assuming conventional mortgages in the early 80s. Then in the late 80s, both FHA and VA, and they were about a year or so apart, but FHA came first, then VA, then said, we are not going to uh, allow a, a, a property, a mortgage to be assumed unless we have the right to approve their credit. And they would allow the interest rate to remain the same, and it could for the entire length of the mortgage. They also excluded all investors at that time. And that was a sad thing because it was a really sweet deal to be able to assume FHA and VA mortgages. In fact, back in the 80s, when uh, we had a person that had bad credit or didn't declare their income, such as bartenders and waitresses and things like that, it was really simple to say, we've got to find you an FHA or a VA loan. And nowadays, it, you can't do that. And then the other factor that caused assumptions to kind of go away was, even though they could assume these loans at whatever the rate was when they were originated, since the late uh, 80s, interest rates have actually declined. And so why would a person go to the effort to assume a mortgage when they could actually start a new FHA or VA mortgage and or a conventional for that matter and get it, uh, get it at a lower rate? They weren't changing the rate to a current rate. They were, uh, you were assuming it at the existing rate. Now, one of the benefits that causes us to want to do this, even though I have to be approved on the mortgage on an assumption is the closing costs are less on assumptions than they are when you originate a brand new mortgage. Plus, you're a little bit further into the amortization schedule. And so every payment 
that uh, goes, starting with the very first payment, more goes towards the principal. And you're going to see a really neat uh, anomaly that a lot of people are not familiar with. It's not an anomaly. It's a phenomenon. Um, at any rate, visually, let me show it to you this way. Uh, these are the interest rates that I got from uh, the Freddie Mac, the PMMS, Private Mortgage, whatever it stands for, PMMS. And they give you this on a spreadsheet, which is nice. So you can get it and look at it and manipulate it any way you want to. But these are the interest rates. Uh, they were only doing 30-year fixed. And then for a few years, they did 15-year uh, and then they did assumption, I mean, uh, arm loans for a while, which they just recently quit uh, in October. But at any rate, when I say arm, they don't record the arm rates on the chart. So if you look at these dates, this is where the conventional said, we're going to put a due on sale clause on everything. Then on December 1st of 86, FHA said we're not going to do that anymore. And then a little bit later, March 1st of 88, uh, maybe that's 18 months later or whatever it is, uh, they decided that VA was not going to do it. But look at this slope. Now, there's some hiccups here, but for the most part, it went downhill until about March of 2022. And as you can see, it went straight up. Uh, one little thing that maybe is a bit of trivia that you should know is uh, if we took this spreadsheet that all these rates are on right now and we did an average on them, so it's a 50-year average, the average mortgage rate was 7.75%. So Fannie Mae last Thursday, or uh, Freddie Mac last Thursday said they lowered their rates to 6.13%. So they're approaching 6% right now, uh, is still a whole lot lower than the average for the last 50 years, not to mention, of course, what we had to pay in the early 80s. So let's just go over a couple of these that I might have missed in that summary of the benefits of an assumable, an assumable mortgage. The interest rate will not change for the qualified buyer. Remember, we're only talking about FHA, VA, and USDA mortgages. So it'll only change, uh, it will not change for a qualified buyer. The lower interest rate means lower payments, of course, than they could get a conventional uh, or a new mortgage on. The lower closing costs for originating a mortgage. For instance, there is no appraisal fee on that. So that saves a, a buyer some money right there. But there's a bunch of little smaller fees that are in there. But the biggest fee that you have when you start a new mortgage is the loan origination fee. And then if, if you wanted to uh, assume a conventional mortgage, they would charge it what it's called a transfer fee. It'd be, generally speaking, 1%. Well, FHA charges $500 to assume that mortgage. VA charges a little bit more. Um, they have a funding fee. They charge it, uh, new mortgages, VA mortgages charge a funding fee. And so do assumptions of VA mortgages. They charge a half a percent of the unpaid balance. Uh, it's easier to qualify for an assumption than a new mortgage because uh, some of the numbers are down a little bit lower, debt to income ratio, but more importantly, the payment is less, therefore it doesn't take as much income and that's why it's easier to qualify. Lower interest rate loans means it amortizes faster. Um, now this is the phenomenon I was telling you about and you'll see it in the example that I give you in a moment. If we had two mortgages, one at 3% and one at 6%, and they were both 30-year mortgages for the same loan amount, call it 400,000. You'd think that in order to get the loan from $400,000 to zero, there it would be equal amounts of principal 
throughout that time frame. They would be the same, whether it was a 3% or a 6%. It's not true. A larger amount goes to principal on uh, lower interest rate loans. And so we'll look at that in a moment. You'll see it. Uh, number six, equity grows faster because the loan is further down the amortization schedule. If you assume a mortgage that's 18 months old, then you've only got 27 and a half years left on a 30-year loan. And so you're 18 payments into it. And the last thing I wanted to mention was assumable mortgages could make a home more marketable. Now, here's what I'm talking about there. This is a very common thing in commercial real estate, but in residential real estate, we don't think this way as often, but let's use it as this example. Let's say that we were one of those people that got a mortgage when it was actually a little bit under 3%. Wow, that would have been a really unusual rate, but let's say we did it. And during that 15 or 18 month period of time, uh, properties, if you look at NAR's national average, uh, it probably went up eight to 9% in value. So that equity is reasonable for a person to assume. And you think, well, that might be something that somebody could get their hands on and it would work. Well, if I was could assume a two and three fourths percent interest rate with market value mortgage rates at six and an eighth right now, I'd probably pay a premium for that house because the payments are going to be low, especially if I intended to stay in it for a long time. Even if I wouldn't pay a premium for it, if I had two houses that were let's say they were identical in size, condition, location, but one of them had a, a loan that is assumable at a much lower interest rate than I'd have to pay market rate on the other one. This one is going to appeal to more people. The assumption will appeal, appeal to a lot more people, especially if the agent understands how to explain it. So, and I didn't say this, but if Anywhere along the way, if you want to ask a question, just unmute your microphone and jump in there, or we'll have some time at the end also. Now, I think our target buyer, or if you want to use the words of uh, criminal intent, you know, the FBI profilers, the profile of our buyer that would be looking for an assumption is probably not a minimum down payment purchaser. They're not a 3% down payment. They're not a 5% down payment. They've got a little more than that, maybe 10%. And I'll tell you the reason why uh, when we get to this one uh, example. It's more likely that the person is going to put 10 to 20% down for a payment. And then this, even if the equity might be slightly larger uh, than the 20%, that they've got or the 10% they've got for down payment. We might be able to get some additional second lien mortgage money. And even though we have to pay market rate at that, it's still gonna save them a lot of money. Now, here's a term that you may or may not know, but we're gonna call it assumption gap. And the way it's, what it describes is, you've got a purchase price for the house, less the existing balance of the, current mortgage, that becomes the equity is what's left. Well, if the equity is more than they can afford to put into the house, what they were planning to put into the house, we subtract their down payment from that. And the balance is the assumption gap. That means we need to get a second mortgage for that. Well, Lending institutions are running a little behind on the second mortgages that used to be a very common place, but we'll talk about it in a moment. So I'm getting ready to go through an analysis, which uh, years ago I did it on a spreadsheet. We now have a uh, application on InTouch, our uh, marketing software, that does all the analysis for you. So it's a matter of just 
plugging in the right numbers. So I think you'll agree this is a reasonable, realistic uh, example. I didn't change, I did this for uh, another company a couple of weeks ago. And so I didn't change this to the lower 6.13, but let's just walk down the input screen. We're gonna buy this house for $400,000. Let's pretend that's the list price. It's got an existing mortgage of $337,750, which we know is an FHA mortgage and is assumable. It, it was originated at 3%. It was a 30 year mortgage. And since it started, the owner has paid 15 payments. We're gonna compare this to the borrower putting 10% down payment at whatever the current market rate is in getting a 30 year loan. Since there is an assumption gap there, we're going to say we're, we can get a second mortgage and the second mortgage could come from their personal bank. And uh, you notice I've got this second mortgage financed at 30 years. I don't think you'll find a lending institution that would loan the money for 30 years, but they would do what we used to call very commonly a balloon note. Mm -hmm. So they would do an amortization of a 30 years but maybe they make it due in 10 years or 15 years. So uh, if we didn't get a bank to do this, a saving, uh, not a savings loan, a credit union, uh, by the way, credit unions loan out their own money. They actually have lower cost of funds than banks do. And they're willing to do what they call portfolio loans. So that's a good source. And they may, if you're not a customer of theirs already, they may make you put a deposit in there, but that's okay. Another thing that we could consider is asking the seller to carry back a second mortgage. If they didn't need all their cash out of the house, they might do that. Now, that may not be as big uh, an opportunity because the mortgages, uh, the, uh, the equity in this house is not as big as uh, it would be if the house had was 50% equity. So. At any rate, there are places to find second mortgages. Now, we are going to compare these two options, these two scenarios at a point further down the road. That's a very common way to do it in real estate investments. So which one is going to give us more net worth at the end of some holding period? So we could put whatever number we want in here, but we're gonna put seven years down the road and you notice on this example, I said a 2% appreciation. For the last 40 years, we've had an average of 40%, uh, I'm sorry, an average of 4% for 40 years on a national basis. And in some markets, it's been a lot higher than that. 2% would be very reasonable. We would need to use a number that your buyer felt comfortable with. And so if, it, but if they tried to use a number that was way too high, if they wanted to use an eight or a nine or a 12% number, the way I would probably approach it is this. I'd say, well, you may be right. Uh, it may be that high on appreciation, but I tell you what, let's do. Let's use a lower number. And if it, the analysis still looks good, then you know at the higher number, if you're right, it's going to go off the chart. So if it looks good at the lower number, you know it'll look good at the big one. And by the way, I can come back and change that appreciation just like that. So I'm gonna click the calculate button. And when I do on your screen, what you would see is you get a really quick answer here. Now this tells us already that this doing this deal on the assumption <clears throat> is gonna save the person about $700 Plus, it's going to build their equity faster than getting a brand new mortgage. But let's not look at the answer yet. Let's go through the analysis and see how it works. And then I'm going to give you a, a second view of this because I want you to understand all the different aspects of it. So buyer scenario one is he's going to get a new conventional mortgage. So $400,000 
purchase price, 10% down payment, $360,000 mortgage. At, now, remember, I told you it's 6.61 right now. Uh, I, I'll rerun the numbers for you if you want me to in a moment. Uh, the payment on the new conventional mortgage, and this is principal and interest, would be 230155. You know what? I take that back. This is this is a total payment, not just principal and interest. This is PITI and MIP or PI, PMI. Okay. So now at 2% appreciation in seven years, this $400,000 house is going to be worth $460,000. So we subtract the unpaid balance, which you're not looking at here, from the 460 and their equity in this property seven years from now would be 133,964. Okay, now we tell this uh, buyer, you may not have thought about it before, but this happens to be an FHA mortgage, which is assumable. And so what I'm gonna suggest is this, buy the house for 400,000, you wanted to put 10% down, let's put 10% down. The existing mortgage at 3% interest has 28.8 years left on it, has an unpaid balance of 328,902. You'll assume the existing payment, 142397, and we're gonna get a second mortgage for the assumption gap. In this case, we would need a $31,000 second mortgage, which I estimated at 6.5%. Even if you had to do 7.5%, it wouldn't matter. The payment on this, even though it's 30-year amortization to make the payment low, it might have a due on sale clause on it. Probably will. But that second lien payment would be $196.56. Now we add this payment with that payment, and the total payment is $1620.53, which is $681,000. I'm sorry, $681 less than doing the new first mortgage. But we've got to go a little bit further. This house is still going to be this worth the same because you're paying 400000 for it, whether you assume it or you get a new mortgage. But the unpaid balance on the existing first mortgage will only be 272 in seven years. And the unpaid balance on the second mortgage would be 28. So your future equity is 159201 which means you have $25,000 more equity by assuming than you did by starting a new mortgage. And that's because the interest rate was lower on that mortgage. And that's that phenomenon that I was talking about. That's an almost a 19% increase in equity because you assume the mortgage. That for enough people would be They'd say, great, I want to buy an equity. That's what we're going to do. Then I wanted to take it one step further for you. And that is, if these people were willing to get a new first mortgage at market rates, what if they were to make the payment as if they had gotten a new mortgage, but then apply that all to the principal and you would do the second mortgage first and then the first mortgage. What that would happen is instead of having this kind of equity in seven years, you wouldn't save the money every month exactly the same way. You wouldn't have extra cash. You'd be putting it towards your principal, which is still your money. It's just equity in the property but your equity would grow in that property from 159 to uh, increased equity of 222, 222.7, so a 66% increase. 
just from my standpoint, I probably wouldn't even bring that subject up with most buyers because I'm, I have this belief that says a confused mind will never make a decision. It may be hard enough for these people to wrap their arms around an assumption, uh, but to start making additional payments and all that, save that for after they close the loan and then you go back and see how they're doing and then just bring it up at that particular time. Let me pause for a moment and ask if we have questions. Nope. You McNaughton's are all sitting back in those comfortable chairs. You're not sleeping back there, are you? I just I see. Okay. It's too, too far to go so I can hear you on the phone, but at any rate. All right. Well, let's just keep moving forward. And I I this is the same information, guys. I just put it on one screen so you could see them both at the same time. We've got the new mortgage over here. And so uh, you've got the payment of 2301, and then the house would be worth 460 minus the unpaid balance. You'd have an equity of 133. On the assumption, whoops, on the assumption, the payment on the first is 16, uh, oh, the total on the first and second is 1620. You have a monthly savings of almost $700. Your increased equity is $25,000 on the assumption at the end of the same seven year period of time, which is an increase of 18, almost 19% of equity. So here's the situation. And I would tell you this, if I was, we were talking about adjustable rate mortgages, uh, I think our job as real estate people, professionals, is to present alternatives to our, our clients. We, we give them choices. It's their job to make a decision. If I presented this to them, and for whatever reason, they didn't like the assumption, I'm not going to try to twist their arm and tell them they're dumb and anything else. I'm going to say, great, we can get you a new mortgage. This is the house you want. We can get you a new mortgage. Let them make the decision. But this gives us the opportunity to present information, which actually will benefit them if they decide to do it. And this is something that I would guess a lot of agents out there, have they just don't understand it. And, and they've never done it before. And there could be people that have done it before, but they've forgotten how it easy it is to do them. So I've got two ways I can go here since we kind of limited this to assumptions. I can do one of two things. I can go through some rules with you here on the different assumptions and that's easy to do. And you're also going to get those in a handout that I sent to Tammy and she's going to get it to you. Um, or I can move a little fast. And by the way, one more thing we can do is I can do another example on the screen to show you how it works. So let's start with those two choices. Which would you rather do? Give me a thumbs up or, or whatever if, if you'd like to, uh, to do a, another problem on screen. Anybody? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's, let's just do that. I'm going to jump over here to a live uh, browser. And I've got this pulled up. Now, by the way, this is part of the InTouch system uh, that is a marketing system. It includes a lot of stuff besides calculators. But when you log in, uh, these would show you what we're going to post for you this week. So I'm going to just go to the menu system and come up here to financial apps. And I may blow this up a little bit so you guys may be able to see it better. Um, okay. Now, uh, there's all sorts of calculators in here, 23 of them, I think, all together. But these are for buyers, sellers, and then there's a bunch of, if you do rental property, 
This is the same investment analysis that CRS uses because they get it from us. So at any rate, we're going to come down to the buyer and we're going to click on the assumption comparison. Does anybody that's on the call today have a listing that they know the numbers on uh, that uh, is a, an, an assumable FHA or VA mortgage? Is there anybody in here We'll, we'll just do a problem with your numbers. And if not, I will pull numbers out of the sky. <laughs> um, I did a $400,000 one a minute ago just because uh, that's about the median sales price nowadays, but we could go lower or higher. Uh, I'll go lower. And I'll just say, we've got a house that's on the market for $350,000. Originally, and I could work backwards on this if I wanted to, to make it realistic. If homes have gone up 9%, uh, get my trusty financial calculator out here. So today's value is $350,000. and. Uh, They've gone up 9% in the last year. <clears throat> and we do one year. This person would have paid about 320 for it. So if they put 3% down, uh, whoops. Point uh, oh okay <clears throat> so their mortgage balance would have been about thirty thousand or their mortgage amount when they bought it would be about if they bought it FHA would be thirty thousand nine hundred let's say they they got it at three percent. 30-year loan, and let's say 16 payments have been made. Now, compared to today, a new mortgage with 10% down, uh, and we use 6.13% interest rate, and let's say that we had to pay 7% for a second mortgage at a bank, but we amortize it for 30 years. And then just to show you something, let's say seven years from now, we believe that if it lasts 40 years, it's been averaged 4%. There's no reason that it wouldn't do that again for the next seven years. So we'll do 4% appreciation. We'll, we'll hit calculate. And I'm just going to show you what this looks like. In scenario number one, the, uh, the payment here, uh, purchase price is $350 less $35,000 down payment. $315,000 mortgage at 6.13%. Uh, you know, I said something a moment ago that I might have spoken out of turn, so I want to confirm this number with you real quick. I'm going to put... Okay, this is principal and interest payment, not total payment, principal and interest, because they know the taxes and insurance, regardless of whether they uh, were getting a new loan or the assumption. Okay, so this house, seven years from now, would have an equity of almost $180,000 with a 10% down payment and 4% appreciation. Now, let's look at this. If we assume this mortgage, because it was an FHA mortgage, uh, the current unpaid balance is $300,000. Uh, then we've got a, uh, the payment's 1302. We're gonna need a second mortgage of $14,600. That payment would be 9743. 
This example, the total payment's $1,400. They would save $515 against a, uh, a new first mortgage at today's rates. The equity is going to be almost $21,000 more seven years from now on the assumption than it will be on the new mortgage. So think of it this way, by the way. In this example right here, the way it reads with me in this position right here, these people save $500 a month for, for 84 months. So that would be $42,000 they saved in lower payments. Plus their equity is almost $21,000 higher. That's a big savings, don't you agree? Okay, well, there's nothing like feedback in a room uh, where everybody is saying, oh, wow, Pat, that's really neat. That's great and everything. So I'm not getting that over a Zoom call, but I, I hope you're excited about it. Now, let me show you one more thing. And this is what programs like this allow you the ability to do. You've Pat, always- Go ahead. I just okay. had a quick question. Sure. The the uh, on the uh, higher return at the bottom is that yeah. similar? Is that similar to the internal rate of return when you're doing a CCIM analysis? Well, not really. What it it is is it's the difference in these two equities. Okay. And and it's a thirty eight percent increase. So that's not the internal rate of return. No, it is not. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was going to say, <clears throat> all the years selling houses with to couples, it, it's rare that they both agree on things throughout the entire conversation. Uh, one of them may be more logical. One of them may be more emotional. And it's okay. There could be a spouse that wants to say, well, I don't know if that's right. And they want to assert their own little thing in there. It's not a competition. So my advice would be to say, well, I'd repeat what they're offering up as a, could sound like an objection, but it may not be an objection at all. So let's just say he says, I, I don't think that appreciation is right. I think it's too high. Okay, don't worry about it. I'll hit the back button here. Now I have the chance to change my input screen. So I say, what would you feel more comfortable with? And he says, 3% appreciation. So I say, okay. So I get to play what if, very simply. And you'll notice that the equity did change here because the house is going to be worth less money because it's appreciating at 3% instead of 4%. So the equity on the New mortgage is 148.6. And on the assumption, they still saved $500 a month. The savings didn't change because it was just the appreciation that changed. So their increased equity is still almost $21,000. So I, whether I change the interest rate or I change the term or the price of the second mortgage or whatever it may be, you know, it, I'll just go back one more thing. In today's market, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of millennials are living at home. I bet there are parents right now that would like them to move out. Uh, they could give their kids uh, gifts. And by the way, they can give gifts. Uh, all of a sudden, I've got a brain cramp, and I can't think of, is it 14000 or is it, no, it's 17000 this year, isn't it? And for 2023. I, I could look it up. It's but 17. 17? Is that what yes. you said, Ron? Yes. Okay, good. It was Thank 13 you. before, and it went to 17. So if we looked at this example, uh, oh, I don't need to go back there. If we looked at this example, 
Look at that. The second mortgage was 14645 So there could be a parent that is willing to, regardless of whether they're trying to move them out of the house, maybe they weren't living at home, but there still could be a parent that is sitting on money that they would be willing to gift to their kids. There's a lot of ways to skin this second mortgage area. And, and so you need to just keep these different things in mind. Okay, now I'm gonna jump over here real quick and get back to my slides because I'm now noticing uh, we only got a few minutes left. In your handout that you'll get, these are in there. Uh, so I'm gonna address the ones that make sense. They've got to qualify, the buyer on a FHA assumption has to qualify under the current FHA underwriting guidelines. They have to have a minimum credit score of 580. Now, you know to get the best interest rate, they've got to have 620 if you do FHA mortgages. But 580 uh, is all they need on an assumption. So that's a little bit of a break, making it easier for them. These are their debt ratios, which I think are pretty close to the normal debt ratios. I've already told you what the transfer fee is. They're not available for investors. If they assume a mortgage without doing the approval in the deed of trust on the note, there is a due on sale clause. And so if you kind of do this under the table, you're going to get caught or you could get caught and then you'd have to refinance the whole house. Uh, so we don't ever obviously suggest you, anybody do things that are not legal. Uh, the lender on this deal, once the new buyer qualifies for the mortgage, the lender must grant a release of liability uh, to the original maker of the note. And so that's a a good thing from, the, from their standpoint. Okay, on a USDA, for those of you that do USDA mortgages, uh, you know that, and I'm looking for, there's a household income requirement to get a USDA mortgage to begin with. So the assumer on a USDA mortgage has to qualify under that it can't exceed 115% of the average median income for that particular area where the house is located. So that's an important issue. Other than that, uh, there, there's no funding fee uh, on USDA mortgages like there is on a VA fee. The VA, I want to explain this to you real quick because this is the one thing that you could be thinking about that could be uh, not in favor of the seller doing it. Some veterans want to sell their house on an assumption and they want to be able to get the, all of their eligibility back. Well, the only way to do that is if the person assuming their mortgage is a qualified veteran with eligibility. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, they're agreeing to take over all the liabilities on this thing, and uh, the seller has got to submit evidence that the payments have been made on time for the previous 12 months. So if they were late for a while, it could disqualify this mortgage from being assumed. Uh, this is a normal VA uh, number, but the buyer doesn't have to be a veteran, but they do still have to qualify under the VA uh, qualification guidelines like this debt to income ratio. If you do VA loans, you certainly understand that they have a different way of qualifying people. They use a thing called residual income, which means after you make the mortgage payment and any other long-term debt, you have enough income to pay for food and other things that they think you're going to need. Um, so in addition to that half a percent that I was telling you about, VA can charge a $300 transfer fee also. It's still less than 
the, the normal funding fee. Here's something I wanted to tell you about FHA I forgot to say a moment ago. Let's say that I got my loan through Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo sold the loan to Bank of America. I don't have to go through Bank of America if they're currently servicing the mortgage to get my FHA loan, the new buyer approved. I could go to any FHA approved lender and they'll charge these fees that, you know, the $500 fee, that's what that lender would end up getting to go through all the paperwork to do that. So you don't have to, to go back through the original, uh, whoever's holding the note right now. Okay, so let's talk about practical situations real quick. Nowadays, when you take a listing, you've got to have your antenna up and ask yourself, I wonder if this is an FHA mortgage. Now, if you sold it to them, you certainly know. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll ask them the questions. Well, if you do, you need to contact the lender in writing to verify what the loan is. Years ago, uh, when I was active selling property, we would always get a lender information letter, uh, mortgage information letter, MIL is what we call them. But, you know, when we stopped putting that in MLS, there wasn't any reason to do that anymore except to have the right unpaid balance, which we could probably get off of their monthly statement. Uh, you need to confirm the process of assumption with the lender at that point because they may not want to uh, approve the new borrower because it's out of their bailiwick. They don't have a system, a protocol set up for that. So if that's the case, then you need to find another FHA approved lender that our VA approved lender that's willing to do that. And try to confirm the costs that are involved on the transfer fees. One more practical situation is uh, FHA, as far as I know, throughout the United States has pretty much eliminated financing, uh, existing, excuse me, existing financing information in the listing that they publish. So in order to do this, you're going to probably have to include it in special provisions or the description or something else. I don't know if you can uh, search in your local MLS for an assumable mortgage. Once this becomes popular enough, if you're on the MLS committee, you should, or, or maybe you've got somebody in your office that's on it, you should certainly bring the subject up and say, this is something we need to add to our uh, profile on the listings. Now that you've got this knowledge, you need to market. Everything is all about marketing. You can't have your lamp under a bushel basket. You gotta let everybody see it. So that means when you're writing newsletters and, and doing other promotional pieces, you need to talk about these things. And these were just articles that we did in InTouch. And then we also do things uh, with social media posts. And so what you really need to do is uh, alert sellers to the fact that they may have a loan that's assumable now. And, and it'd be a, a great way to get buyers, especially if your marketing has slowed down enough in your area that you, you think, ah, this could be something that we could do. And, and then you could do videos. Now, I'm not going to show you this video, but it's less than a minute and it goes through all the details of piquing someone's interest about assuming an FHA or a VA mortgage. So that's kind of a nice thing to be able to do. Now, for some reason, my computer is uh, sticking right now, but at any rate, we don't have time to address buy downs. I would I'm always worried that I'm going to run out of material before I run out of time. So has that what I am happened, going, Pat? <laughs> it does happen. Yeah, doesn't it? So I would like to get to one more place to just to give you a, just a little bit of information about what InTouch does. Um, and it's got to pause and catch up on it. But some of you may be using InTouch right now. I don't know. But uh, at any rate, InTouch is a digital marketing service. Uh, 
Um, we've been around in this product for 12 years. Uh, we do three main things. We do automated email where you upload your database and we send out newsletters, holiday greetings, and special occasions like birthdays and anniversary. We do automated social media posting on Facebook business pages, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. We do a weekly article automatically to your post, and we do a landing page, which is where a lot of the materials we have are available for you to embed into your website for additional content, which includes the calculators. So uh, the newsletters are great looking newsletters. They're single topic newsletters with good looking photographs, easy to read, easy to understand and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a feel for what uh, some of the holiday greetings uh, throughout the year look like. And these go out automatically. You can pick and choose which holidays you wanna send out. We also do automatically birthdays, anniversaries and home anniversaries. We, I want you to get a feel for what the social media posts, we have three different style. We do videos at no extra charge. These are infographics that are kind of like billboards. And we do short stories uh, that have too much information to go on a single picture like these do. But all of these are meant to help homeowners, not only when they buy and sell, but all the years in between to build your brand as a real estate professional to create top of mind awareness. So, uh, and I'm gonna skip some of this because I'm conscious of the time. Come on, it's gonna catch up in a moment. And so here's what I'm gonna suggest you do. Oh. <laughs> Too fast for the computer, Pat. Yeah. Uh, Oh, these are nice, by the way. These are information guides that we make available. We use them in our content. Uh, when we say, for more information, download our seller's guide or our buyer's guide. But these are branded with your name on every page and also on uh, the cover on various subjects and that sort of thing. Uh, we've got the fa financial calculators that are available to the public side. And then you have additional ones that are on your uh, private side and that sort of thing. And I'm not going to go through these. We'll do them at another date when we've got more time. This is for you to put all your personal recommendations for service providers. This is really a good deal. And you, we give you the HTML code to embed this in your website. So it, it's, it's a nice thing. So basically our customers like what we do because it's a bargain. The material is such a bargain uh, if you don't have the time to do it, don't have a staff person, or maybe you've got a staff person that would be better off doing something else, let us do it for you. We'll do it for $39 a month, which includes everything we do. We do it by the year for a little bit less. We have no contract. Uh, quit it whenever you want. Setup is incredibly easy. We can actually take control of your computer and do it for you. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to show you, and it's not coming up with that, is if you're interested in it, I wanted to give you a promo code that you could go to. And uh, I see why I didn't do it. I had the slide hidden, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't have the right one in there anyway. I said that went away. Here's what I want you to use. Go to our website, which is star, which is intouchsystems.com. There we go. But you're going to use the promo code star power forget this uh, we i just want you to use uh starpower.com uh, star power period go to intouchsystems.com and use the promo code star power and we'll give you a 30 day uh trial and you will get uh the $100 startup fee waived okay let me stop and ask questions of you. Anybody have any burning things that they didn't get an answer for? Pat, I have one. Um, okay. And you may or may not have advice on this. Some people, when you mention the balloon on the second, get a little nervous. Do you speak at all or do you have statistics on 
what the average moving cycle is for people to kind of give them peace of mind about that 10 years? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I know all the stats from first time home buyers are staying in home seven years. Um, the existing uh, homeowners are typically staying 10 to 12 years. But, you know, the reality of the situation, and maybe it's just because I'm so comfortable in the financial world, banks are sitting on so much cash right now, it's unbelievable. That's why I'm not worried about the second mortgages. If they can get uh, more than what they're having to pay on their CDs, they can justify it with a reasonable risk. And so, uh, you know, if, if I was talking to a seller, let's pretend I have a seller for a minute and then I'll go back to the banker. If I'm talking to a person that's going into a retirement home or maybe they've already bought their uh, home they're going to live in and they're sitting on a whole lot of cash, that seller's biggest problem is where am I going to park this money to give me income? And they want income more than anything else. Now, too many times agents try to make a decision for their sellers without letting them make the decisions because uh, they personally need the cash and, and the seller may not be in that situation at all. If I could loan money out at 10 to 12% a day, a 10 to 12% a year, I could, I'd do it all day long uh, for reasonable risk. Of course, I won't loan 100%, uh, no down payment or anything like that. But if the people are putting 10% down, on a regular conventional loan, these are the guidelines that most lenders do. Uh, a bank wants to know that the borrower has as much cash in the property as they do. That's why I use that example. They wouldn't probably wouldn't do let the borrower put 5% down and, and ask for a 15% second mortgage. But 10 and 10 is reasonable. And, and they, they have a feeling for that. Now, if the, you take it one step further and the person actually has a uh, relationship with a bank, which, you know, I, I wonder how many people do nowadays, but if they've got deposits and different checking accounts and their credit cards there and stuff like that, they're going to stand a much better chance of getting the loan. If they've got a neighborhood bank compared to one of these national banks like Wells Fargo Bank of America, they probably stand a better chance because they actually will see the same law officer more than once when they go into the bank. So uh, those are just a few odds and ends on that. Hey, Pat, if you, go yes. to, if you go to 15 years on your calculations, I'm seeing that more than 30 years on amortization okay. for the second. Uh, how much, what kind of a change? Well, I'll just flip back there. I'm glad you suggested that, Ron. Uh, so we're back over here. It's the same example we did a moment ago. So I'll just come over here on this and we'll change this to 15 years. Go back to calculate. Now, on this particular one, which we dropped it down to 3% appreciation, remember? Right. Uh, on this example, it's still showing 97 a month. And that's a okay. 30 year, that's a 30 year amortization. Okay. Something's not, we may have to put all the numbers in again. This is 15 years. Right. Oh, oh, oh. You put it I on the mortgage it. instead of the second. Yeah, I didn't well, do the second. Yeah, go down. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now this will look reasonable. Okay, so the monthly savings on this wow. one. Is There's only a $20 difference, $25 difference. Yeah, well, remember, it's, uh, yeah. In the payment, I mean, it's 480, and I think the other one was like 513 or something. Well, this is the savings. Oh, so if, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is oh, the same. payments 131 versus 96. Second more the second mortgage payment. This is 13163 and then if I go back over here 
The other one was 97. So that's okay. okay. So it didn't bump that much, really. 40 bucks, 40. Yep. Bucks. $33, $34 a month. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Anything else? One second, Morgan, can you usually get a lower rate? What other questions do you guys have for Pat? Pat, this has been awesome. Pat, there was one question in the chat. It says, on FHA, am I correct in thinking there isn't an upfront mortgage insurance premium, just the $500 fee? Well, it, the, you're right. There is no upfront because it was paid by the original lender. Now, you know FHA mortgages uh, have MIP on them for the life of the mortgage now. And so... Uh, they will just start assuming the fine. renewable. That's what I was saying. Yes. It'll be in the yeah. payment. I've got a quick question on VA. Okay. If a loan was paid off, in other words, somebody came in, assumed the loan, but didn't take, the, didn't, did not take the financial responsibility, but the loan is now paid off totally because it's over 30 years. Yeah. And that vet, can the original vet get another VA loan? Uh, by the way, uh, pro yes, they, they're going to have to show that the loan was paid off uh, and establish proof for it, but that would be pretty easy with the release of lien on the property or something like that, but it, right. it's a little tenuous when it's got a different borrower you know, on it. Right. But yes, the answer is yes, they can do that. They may still have partial eligibility because you remember uh, the way the eligibility works they increase the numbers from time to time to time. So whenever they started it, they use all their eligibility when they buy it, all the available eligibility when they buy it. So if this was just a year or two ago, then chances are they didn't have any eligibility left. But if it they 20 years ago, they might still have VA eligibility. Yeah, I'm thinking of an old older vet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you very much for uh, going through this. I hope it was beneficial to you. Uh, Tammy will get you the handout so you'll have the list of different things that I, uh, it'll actually have the handout, the slides from that 2-1 uh, buy down that we didn't have time to talk about. So uh, at any rate, and then we'll try to do something later on at a, another date. And, and then it, maybe at some point in time, we can do uh, more of a marketing side of this for you. I would love that, Pat. I had no idea how deep your product has gone. <laughs> <It's an originated laughs> Thank you very much. Well, oh, by the way, just on that one little note, let me, you know, I've been a CRS instructor since, well, actually I've been involved with CRS since it started in 1978. And I've been an instructor with them since 1982. Uh, and so what we did when we started coming out with our uh, software program in 1990, everything we taught in all the courses, that, and those were the stable of two-day courses, there were five of them, we, in, we said, okay, we're going to make this work because, you know, we used to have to go to classes, and what we had to do was we found some great idea that this instructor had, but then we had to go back to our office and create whatever we saw on the screen. So what we were doing in our software was anything, whether it was on the sales course, the listing course, the finance course, the investment course, we took that and made examples that people could plug and play immediately and make it look good for them. And, and so that's why our product is as deep as it is. It really supports the philosophy of CRS and the stuff that we learned, uh, you know, the same people that Howard, we were all learned from the same people. So anyway. I'm one of the first. Well, you've really rounded it out nicely. Thank you. I'm impressed. Thank you so much, Pat, for your time today. Wow, this was so valuable. <laughs> Um, I, I see other heads nodding too. And let's, yeah, let's get scheduled um, at least one, if not two more uh, webinars with you if you're game for it. Sure, absolutely.
All right, everyone. Thanks for being here today. We appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck.